Hello everyone, it is February 20th, 2021. It's Saturday? It's Harp Saturday! So, welcome to this Harp Tuesday edition that's a few days early because this is a special sort of crossover edition which is coincides with the release of the very first episode of my new series, Harpist in the Wild. Harpist in the Wild released today on February 20th and it featured a piece that I wrote, an ensemble piece for three parts that I wrote called A Winter's Day. I wrote this in 2017. And so here in, in today's Harp Tuesday episode, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to play it. And you can get the sheet music for free by signing up to my email newsletter. There should be a link up here in, in the video description down below. This is a piece that I wrote for my students for a harp party in 2017, where we all got together and had a bunch of people playing each of these parts. And I wanted to write a, it to be as accessible as possible. A wide variety of skill levels, wide range in terms of harp sizes. So this is playable on a harpsicle. You certainly don't need to go below this C and, and on that video, Harpist in the Wild, I'm playing my little electric harp. And oftentimes each part is only playing with a single hand. So it's, it's again, trying to be really fairly easy to play, but I think quite fun. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first go over each of the individual parts and give you some thoughts on playing them. And then from there, move to looking at the score and, and kind of talking about some ensemble ideas in terms of playing in an ensemble and how to fit in and how to how to read the score and all that good stuff. So let's start by looking at the bells part. And this, again, the idea that all three parts, bells, uh, snow and wind are trying to conjure up this idea of a winter's day. And so with the bells, we start off by just going switch. Back and forth like that. And couple things I guess to be aware of here, and that is trying, even though we're replacing each time before playing the, the, before playing each note. So we play two, we put that finger back on before playing the thumb. If possible, you want to try and get in position and then place kind of at the last minute so that the fact that we're replacing on a ringing string is covered up by the note that we're playing. So instead of that kind of staccato feel, that we get a little bit more legato. So something to listen for and play around with there. And also, of course, we're going back and forth between two, one, two, one, two, one. And so just trying to make sure that though both those fingers are playing at an equal volume. So we don't want to hear too much of two. especially because it's on the downbeat, right? But maybe your thumb is a little bit weak and we need to focus on playing it firmly. Or maybe... You're hearing a lot of thumbs. So if if you're hearing that, one of the ways to do to work on that is to do the opposite. If I'm hearing a lot of thumb, I'll try accenting too. And playing the thumb really softly. But sometimes it's just enough to be aware of it, to hear it, and, and then just listen for the evenness. So again, very basic sort of pattern, but lots of things you can think about um, while playing it. So we do that, and, it, and it's worth kind of analyzing and looking at that, that we have a sort of two-bar phrase, right? This GB, GC, back to GB, and then GC. So another two-bar phrase, and another one, and then two more bars, but this time they are all the same, that G, B, G, B, G, B. And there is a writ here, and I think I'll talk about that a little bit later, but just something to be aware of. And then we get this, and if, if you've never played an orchestra or a musical or an ensemble before, you might wonder what, what this two means and this symbol here, etc. And it's just a way of showing that we have two bars of rest. So imagine that you have 40 bars of rest. You don't want to clutter up the page with 40 individual bars. It's much cleaner and easier and, and effective to instead do something like this, where you would have like 20 or 40 or whatever, the number of bars and, and then this little symbol similar to this. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a notation thing that lets you fit a whole bunch of bars in 
of rest in a single bar. So very handy, so that's what that means. Two bars of rest. And then we get this sort of lovely little middle pattern. So I'm starting with two, four, even though I'm gonna go right back to three on that E, because I think this is a little bit more comfortable than this stretch here. And sometimes it's nice to switch fingers, right? You could, of course, start with three. Totally up to you. So we get that, and again, we can look here, we get it. Here's once, twice, three times, four times. Oh, and then here, this is something a little bit different. So it starts the same, the first bar. But then we just go right back up to four, three, two, one. So basically, apart from this very starting note, the one with, with two, it's four, three, two, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, two, three, four, three, two. Cool. So it's just, you don't want to get so caught up in the... To do the same, to make sure that when you do get to this two bar phrase, you're ready to keep going and do the full two bars. Then we get another two bars of rest. Then we get uh, maybe the most challenging part for the bells here uh, is this next little section. So we go one, two, three. So three in a row, skip two strings down to the D. One, two, three, four, three, two. So on the way back up, almost the same, except the thumb goes to the C. Two goes right back to the A just played. One, thumb goes to the B. And here we are, we're gonna repeat. So three in a row, skip two strings to the D then. Thumb is going to the C. Two right back to the A. And so of course, if you look at this initially, you might say, oh, first of all, maybe there's a bunch of ledger lines up here. Like what, what, is, what is this note, right? What is, uh, where'd my pencil go to? Um, what is this note up here? It's a C, um, and, and or this note right here, which is a B. So that can be maybe a little bit intimidating. And then again, maybe you're just reading through note by note, but as soon as we can kind of recognize that this pattern just keeps repeating. So this bar starts with a rest right here, but then this bar here and this bar and this bar and this bar, they're all exactly the same. Great, so we kind of recognize that and then just kind of learn this pattern. This one, two, three, four, three, two, one, two, one, two. And we're good to go. And then we get a bar of rest and then we're back to, instead of this, we go for a whole bunch of bars. And we'll talk about that in a moment. A little bit of a writ towards the end and we finish, that's it. There's the bells part. Cool, let's look at snow part. So the snow part is a little bit lower and it starts with these harmonics. Two E harmonics, so left hand. Again, this I just wrote this on a single staff, right? So there's no bass and treble clef, it's just, just bass clef here, but this is gonna be right hand and this is gonna be left hand. I guess I didn't specifically mark that, um, but because it's just the single line, uh, it's maybe kind of implied. Anyway, I'm telling you now but that, that you can do them. You don't have to try to somehow do a double harmonic with one hand, uh, an octave apart. You get to do right hand and left hand, wherever it is. And so I'll link uh, in the video description down below and try to throw up a link here as well. To, I've done a bunch of episodes looking at harmonics. So this will be a left hand one like this. and a right-handed one like this, and so we do seven of them. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. And then we get, here's the snow falling, we get E, G, E, G, E, G, a whole bunch of those, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And and then, and let me get a, let me get my yellow highlighter here. And then here, midway through bar 21, we go, Now we're up to G and B, 
we hang out on that until we finally get this little bit of a writ here at bar 28. And then we finish with these harmonics. Cool. So apart from the harmonics, and, and you know, you could play them as normal notes. You could play them as normal notes an octave higher because that's where the harmonics are sounding, right? The, this sound is this a little out of tune, but anyway, this note up here. So, uh, but yeah, again, hopefully pretty, pretty accessible, right? And then finally, there's the wind part. So the wind has these, these two different rolled chords at the beginning. Now they're both the same shape, root position, and then the thumb moves up. So root position E minor, and then the thumb moves up to C in both hands. So now it's a first inversion C chord. The only thing to think about this in terms of these rolled chords is fitting them in with the rest of the ensemble. So maybe I'll say that to the ensemble bit as well. So anyway, that's just keep in mind, we got these rolled chords. Then at bar nine, we've got some chords, but with a down arrow, right? And that just means we're gonna roll them, but going down. But actually, oh, and this is a good reminder. So I will I will correct this in the version that you will get if you sign up for my email list, but um, start on the beat because I want these on the beat. I want these to start on the beat. So with other rolled chords, we're trying to, that's the beat. We, we, the beat comes with a thumb, with a top note, the very top B or C. So we have to start the roll a little bit early. Whereas these, these downward ones, I want the, now, not specifically to downward ones, but in this particular case, I would like this B again to be the beat. So we go. And it's actually a little bit easier in the sense because we know where the beat's coming. We just have to start on the beat and then the rest of them happen where, where they, where the, wherever they happen. And then these chords, again, same chord in both hands solid chords because they're not marked rolled. And again, in harp music, if none of the chords are marked with a rolled chord marking, it could mean that we shouldn't roll any of them, but it could quite likely mean that we could roll whichever ones sound good to us, right? That oftentimes on the harp, unlike say the piano, a rolled chord is a very acceptable way of playing a chord, right? We don't need the rolled chord symbol specifically that by default, often we will roll a chord. But in a piece where there are a bunch of rolled chord markings and then some are not marked rolled, that is a strong suggestion that whoever arranged or composed it wants those chords to be solid. Now, I could have been even clearer, and maybe again I will do this in the final version, by putting these sideways brackets, which mean a solid chord. Yeah, maybe I'll do that just to, just to be as clear as possible. So chord, chord, bar of rest. And then this is kind of interesting because it's the same chord in both hands, but you'll notice the way that Finale at least templates this. Here we have the G kind of sticking out and here we have the A kind of sticking out. Because again, when you get two notes, say here G and A or G and A, right next to each other on the, on the scale, on the, on the staff, right? If they were right above each other, just like this, this chord is stacked right nicely above each other, but if they were right on the same vertical line, they would bump into each other, right? They get squ squashed. So like if we had a, if we had a note here and another note here, you know, like here, and then also here, they're overlapping and it's just would be very hard to read. So that's why we get those kind of shifted apart. It doesn't mean that they're played at a different time. It just means that for, uh, typesetting, it has to be done that way. So again, even though these look different on the page, they're the same E, G, A in each hand. And once, once you recognize that, then you could just read the bottom chord or the top chord and not have to look at both chords, right? And then this is the same one. And then this is just a little bit different, right? Because so these two are the same. And these two are almost the same because this chord is the same, 
but this chord here is a little bit different, right? It, it just, just in the right hand that we don't have the B on top. Then we got some more chords. And then rest. One, two, three, four. One, two, sorry. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. So this is the hardest bit because we've had whole notes, some half notes, but now a quarter note. We have to jump, right? So the third finger is just moving up one, but two and the one, the second finger and the thumb, have to move up two strings to go from this root position shape to this second inversion shape. And then we end the way we started with some rolled chords. Cool. So I'm going to now pull up the score so we can see everything because anytime you're playing in an ensemble, in a group, or even just in a duet with somebody else, it can be really helpful to see what everyone else is playing too, so that you don't just have to rely on your part. You can see how everything fits together, right, in terms of playing in a group. And so let's take a look at this at the very beginning. Here's this very beginning. And I wanted to talk about these rolled chords. So especially when you're in an ensemble, if there's a bunch of people playing these rolled chords, we'd like to kind of do them at the same speed. So you might have to talk in your, in your section. Let's, let's try practicing these together. Can we get them? Or. Or. You know, whatever sounds good to you, whatever, whatever works, but to try to have it sound as one single large harp everyone rolling the chord at the same time. So that's easier said than done, right? And then also, again, we notice that everyone is playing on this downbeat, right? That the bell part goes, it's got this G, the snow has these harmonics, and the wind has the rolled chord. So the wind part is gonna start, we'll hear this first, and then along with this, we'll hear, or, So that if you're playing these rolled chords, you just have to be aware that somebody's going to cue this, whether you're, it's a conductor or you don't really need a conductor in this case necessarily, but one of the parts would try to give a nice cue, right? So one, two, three, four, and one. So if one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. And then once that's established, the bell part. So what we notice here then is snow and wind are playing just on the downbeats, but the bell part has the moving part. It has all these eighth notes. So they are really establishing the tempo for us. And we can just listen for that. Um, and, and so, yeah, we go along. And then again, ensemble wise, here we get this little bit of a writ in terms of kind of What happens next? Let's check what let's check what happens next. I'll do this little half page turn. Next, the snow part comes in with their eighth notes. So as the bell part, you want to try and give a good cue to show when the downbeat is so that all the snow parts can come in bang right there or the conductor can cue it or right? something. So just if you're playing the snow part, then having to listen and be aware of what's going on that bar before you come in. Uh, and then the same thing right at the end of the piece where it's the snow part that is finishing off with this little bit of a writ bar. Um, trading back to the bell part. So again, trying to cue, physically cue what's going on. And then the very end, here the bell part, if there's only one, again, if it's just a trio, if it's just one person playing each part, then the bell part can do whatever they want there, right, very easily. If you are playing with other people, then just needing to practice that ending, all the bell part people, so that 
again, try to physically kind of breathe together and cue and, 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 and try to end together. And, you know, the, uh, all is one instrument. So really, those little moments are quite magical. And then I just want to talk about sort of how to deal with. So let's go, let's go back to, for example, the snow part. And I'm just going to clear all this. If we look at this, that we, 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 for so many bars, we're going. And how, how not to get lost? Like, what, well, okay, do we just have to like glue our eyes to the page and, and, and follow along? Well, not necessarily. So a couple things. First of all, is you're reading through it, trying to figure out, okay, do we do that? all the way until 29 right here is this still the same thing oh it's not right to, so as i say to locating this moment and and highlighting it potentially of where does it change which is which is right here right this is different and then this is different as well and then, then that this pattern stays on until the end of that all those eighth notes so noticing that okay great and then what you want to do certainly is count the number of times your bars you're going to go. And what can be really helpful, so we can count them, um, right? Because so it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and that's going to change. Twelve. Okay. And so a really, really essential skill in terms of playing ensemble in an ensemble, especially as a harpist in say an orchestra where often you're counting bars of rest, lots of bars of rest, 40 bars of rest, more. You, a great way to count that is, so in this case, four, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four. So the downbeat, you, you, that keeps going up, right? And it's a good skill to practice listening to music to try to have that start to become automatic so you can it kind of goes on in, in, in the background um, and, and you don't lose count. So we can certainly do that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 11, 2, 3, 4, 12, 2, 3, 4, and then 13, 13, 13, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, Oh, and then this goes on. So how many of those, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four. Now, I would definitely suggest, and I'm just going to clear all this again. I would definitely suggest is when you count them, write the numbers in above because visually so we th that's the that this auditory thing right we can have that going on hearing that in our head one two three four two two three four visually it's so easy to get lost on the sea of notes and okay did i just play this bar what's next all the same so if you write one two three four sorry it was kind of sloppy five six seven eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, uh, change, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That makes each bar suddenly individual, right? So that visually we have a much better chance of following along. All right, I'm at the two bar, at the three bar, Four, right it, it breaks up this long sea of notes into into as I say unique and individual bars so that's really I think you should definitely do that but we can also then so so we've got the visual then we've got the counting auditory thing going on but of course what we can also do in a situation like this is be aware of what's going on on other parts and look for cues in their parts so that's where we go back to the score and we say, okay, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I'm doing this. One, two, three, four. Oh, but there's this marvelous little tune going on as well. So looking at what's happening here. 
<clears throat> this is bar nine where it starts right here, the snow part. So we can see that there's like two bars of this wind part and then it's bells, wind, bells, wind, bells, wind, bells, wind. Uh, two bars of this bell thing. Oh, and then here, here is our changed bit, right? We're right there, we are changing. Okay, so we could certainly put in here into our, where are we, where is the snow? Two bars before the change that uh, bells, oh, sorry, very, very sloppy, bells, bells, and that it extends all the way through that. That's the, the, that we, it's the only time, right? In that whole section where the bells play for two bars, right? This. Oh, that's right, I got change. Great, there's a great little cue. Now, so cues are great. So, so kind of knowing what the other parts are doing is great. And, and you can kind of go one step further. So again, it partly depends on like how much preparation you have. So first, of course, counting them, writing the numbers over them, then looking for cues in the score and then, if you have time, or certainly during rehearsals, starting to build an auditory awareness, a picture of the entire piece, so that you maybe can sing or hear the other parts. And you can do this also looking just from the score. So that as you're playing this, as we start the snow bit, instead of just going one, two, and three, and four, and we can go dum. Dum bum 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 that we can we you know we can hear in our mind's ear what everything else is doing and that means there's no way we can get lost because we know exactly where we are right if we've built that great picture and that's, and so same thing then for, for any of these parts, like the bells part with this two bars of rest here, we can count them, but we can also know that we're gonna hear bum dee, bum dee. And you listen for dum, dum. Part could be listening to this, knowing it's coming in with this, and then again the wind part can be listening to the, for these two bars. Two, three, four, one. This part for the ensemble is maybe the most confusing because neither wind nor bells are coming in on beat one, so that if we look at the previous bar as well, oops, that didn't do the half page turn that I wanted, that one and two and, sorry, one and two and three and four and 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 one and two. And so here again, for the bells part, we have these seven bars. And again, in the bells part, that one, two, three, four, five. Six. Oh, I could have sworn there were seven. Six, there's six, ha, ah, look at that. So we count them, right? Okay, right, we know there's six. But we can also, from the score and from practicing it, kind of know what's going on that the bells part comes in here. We're gonna hear, we're gonna hear a chord. Just those three chords. One and two and three and four and, 
and that's it. So building that framework. So anyway, just, just some, some things to think about in terms of playing on an ensemble. Um, and I would love to hear from you. Like if you, if you play this piece again with a trio, could be just three, three of you with a group. Of course, that's a little bit hard right at the moment, but um, maybe also putting it together as a video, just like I did with, <laughs> I played all three parts, but remotely, you know, you, you and your friends could film each part and try to fit them all together. So the tempo, by the way, like 84, C84, circa 84, around 84, whatever you feel comfortable, whatever you feel sounds good. And again, check out that Harpist in the Wild. I got an episode coming out every week for the next little while and really excited to share that music with you. And in the meantime, here on Harp Tuesday, I'll see you in, I guess, two weeks and three days. <laughs> see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>